And I was really there wanting to be right on the front lines. Well, as I understand the politicisation of war, I understood that I needed to take a different direction inside me. So instead of listening and responding to the amazing stories of patriotism from my family who fought in the First World War and the Second World War, I decided that I needed to be somewhere else. I needed to work on the political system. I needed to position myself in a place where we can really start to change the whole structure and the system, the systemic reach of these policies that are causing so much destruction in our world. So I studied religion and theology and went on to study a master's in international conflict analysis. Went to work on monetary policy, went, met this extraordinary gentleman here. Now we work on peace and this conversation that we are having in Iowa, starting in Iowa, is about 9-11 to 11-11. From terror of 9-11, to armistice of 11-11. So we're using these two months to really explore this narrative. And part of that, as, um, as has been mentioned earlier, is looking at the redefining of national security. And as we hold these conversations around the country, we understand that people's terminology and understanding of national security is really about human security. It's about having clean water. It's about having land that is rich and fertile so that we can continue to grow our food. It's about having a climate that enables photosynthesis to take place, not one that's too hot and too cold and stopping food production. We need to embrace all of these things job security, economic security, health security, education security. And for me, food is right at the center of this. So the title of what I want to bring to you this evening is really looking at the world beyond GMOs and nourishing the planet and nourishing the world and reversing climate change through regenerative organic agriculture. And this is what we can do. The destructive tendencies of the industrial agricultural system have led us to a place where our soils are eroded. With GMO technology, those two primary types of GMOs, it's not about increased yields, it really is about profits. It's about patenting <laughs> seeds. A handful of companies now own 53% of the world's seed supply. Now, we can look at a Bill Gates of this world who patented a little chip that went into a computer, look at the enormous wealth that that small patent has brought to him. Now imagine that scaled up to our food supply. Every single one of us has to eat in order to live. So these patents and this whole GMO debate is not about increasing yields, it's about increasing profit and consolidating power. Now there's two types of GMOs that we see pervasive in our system. There's pesticide producing GMOs and there's herbicide resisting GMOs. Now, the herbicide-resisting GMOs have been hailed as this extraordinary technology that allows us, for the first time, to spray toxic chemicals directly on our food. Fantastic! <laughs> now, what has that done? We've got Roundup ready corn and soy. Roundup is glyphosate. Glyphosate now, uh, weeds now, are resistant to glyphosate. As was mentioned before, um, I'm the director, um, or one of the board directors on the Rodale Institute, which is the oldest organic research institute in America. And what we've done over the last 30 odd years is a farm systems trial, where we grow conventional next to organic, and for the last handful of years we've been growing GMO test plots as well, to see yield, to see soil health, to look at water retention, all different kinds of issues. Now when we started to grow GMOs, it was obviously a very contentious thing for us to, to choose to do, but we need to remain relevant in our research and really see what's happening to our fields. Now, growing Roundup Ready, glyphosate resistant crops means that you, for the first time, have been able to spray herbicide directly onto a crop. So a plant will grow and this herbicide will hope, well, the farmers hope, will kill all of the weeds around it so that this, this plant can grow. Well, with, after three years, we found that actually weeds were becoming resistant to glyphosate. And so we had to start using something else. We have a glyphosate and then we have to mix in atrazine. So we're using glyphosate and atrazine on our fields after three years. After another couple of years, more resistant weeds to glyphosate and to atrazine, now having to use 2,4-D. 2,4-D is half of the component of Agent Orange. Who knows about Agent Orange? Yes. Good thing? Yes. Not really. High in dioxins, awful chemical. Dennis and I spoke last night in um, Cedar Rapids and we were at a veterans hall and as we were talking about redefining national security, a veteran came up to me afterwards, a veteran of the Vietnam War. 
And he said to me, Elizabeth, you have to do something about 2,4-D. You've got to work on these, on these so-called Agent Orange crops because the way that the, um, the industry now is understanding that, that they're putting out the figures, 80 million acres of American cropland is now blighted with herbicide-resistant weeds. So we have these super weeds all over our land. And that's causing an issue to food security because if you've got weeds growing that you can't get rid of, then what are we actually going to be growing our food in? Instead of just weeds, you can't eat them. So industry's um, solution to this is genetic stacking. So not only do we have now glyphosate-resistant uh, GMOs, but recently, in the last week, the federal government agreed that we can have two 4D resistant GMOs. So they've genetically stacked these two traits of glyphosate resistant and two 4D resistant. So we are now able to, sooner we'll be there meeting a field near you, spraying two 4D on millions of acres of American cropland. This is going to be directly in our food supply, directly onto our food. So there's this mentality that we have, both within our national security, that domination and force and, and some kind of chemical and, and, and aggression towards something will stop something. We know that the war on terror has failed. We're breeding more terror with the very mechanism that we're doing. It's a level of consciousness. The same is true of our fields. We have a chemical warfare with nature, and guess what? Nature is out evolving us. So this, as we see the, the technologies of warfare that have transitioned onto our fields, we're seeing the inevitability of death actually of our society. So water pollution and all of those kinds of things. I want to see a world beyond GMOs. We have extraordinary research that's come out of Iowa University, that's come out of the Rodale Institute, that's come out of family farms all across the world that actually organic agriculture yields the same, if not more, than GMO crops do. But not only that, the profitability is $200 per acre more than GMOs are. Not only that, <laughs> but if we really are stewards of the land, if we really do care about our urban, uh, sorry, about our rural resources of land, and we care about our farmers, we will create systems that actually help people to transition their land and look after and become true stewards of the soil. Because we cannot continue to see the depletion of our soils. We will not be able to feed ourselves. But with organic agriculture, we can put back that plant matter. There is an amazing things that the Rodale is, uh, Institute is doing, really looking at, if you, if you understand with GMOs, you'll be spraying this chemical on, and so when you look at um, GMO, as you know, when, as you look at a corn field, the earth is barren. It's completely dry, it's crispy, nothing really grows up in it. That means that all the water is evaporating. So these crops are dry, so we're having to use more, more and more water resources on these kinds of things. What we do at the Rodin Institute, we, we have cover crops. And cover crops not only put more plant matter into the soil, not only fix nitrogen into the soil, which inevitably feeds the next crop that grows on it, but we use a roller crimper that rolls those cover crops, chops them up at the front end, and at the back, we cut a seam into what is now a kind of carpet, a sort of a plant carpet, so that, which is suppressing weeds and keeping moisture in, and we plant the seeds in this. And weeds are suppressed, water is, and moisture is kept in, the, the plants grow up, and when you look at organic fields, they're a wonderful mix of biodiversity. There's all different kinds of insects, there's all different kinds of plant growth, and they are a lot greener, and they're a lot taller. It's incredible to see in the Rodale Institute, they actually have um, GMO fields around them, all around them. And so you can see the stark contrast between the two methods. And you see this life, and you see the strength of the plants. So not only are they stronger, not only is the soil extraordinary, not only is the water retained, but also these plants are more resistant to extremes in temperatures and, and to extremes of the climate change. So we see that um, soil that has high, um, high plant matter in it actually clumps. And instead of when, when it's put into water, it, it holds together. Soil that has been depleted just falls apart and is all silty. Well, when you have this wonderful organic soil, water that, where you have excess water and flooding, it is, the land is less prone to that. It will absorb more, more moisture. The, the water will come in. Roots will be longer. 
And so plants then in times of drought will have more of an opportunity to, uh, to live and also to thrive. So we've got this amazing thing, but also because of these methods, of because of healthy soil, because of the opportunity to have cover crops, when we look at regenerative organic agriculture methods, the, all the land all around us, all agricultural land, your gardens, anything that, that is around us can actually become carbon sinks. So we are putting so much carbon up into the atmosphere. And yet if all of the agricultural land actually took up organic regenerative agriculture methods, we could actually sequester 56 gigatons of carbon. It's all that we throw up there we can bring back down. So instead of having, as we do now with the depletion of our land, soil actually being a carbon pump, putting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, it can be the most effective sink. It can start pulling it down. So this is the potential for agriculture. You are right on the front line. I am so glad I'm not in a plane flying overhead in some poor godforsaken country. I am here with you. We will do this together. You are in the most extraordinary position as Iowans to really turn this debate. That when those candidates come through, that you really stand up and you let them know exactly what you feel as Iowans and you vote exactly for what you want. And I am so thrilled to be here in Des Moines with you leaders who are standing for the issues on the right side of the issues. As I was when Dennis and I were in Cedar Rapids yesterday, I can't believe the leadership that's already in local government. And I'm so thankful to be with you today.